Republic of Women Voters has been working on redistricting reform for more than 40 years. And it, it, we are so close, so close, but we're not there yet, and we've got a lot of work to do, and you're gonna all be hearing about it this afternoon. And with that, let's get the show on the road. But before we do, let's please give a big round of applause to the volunteers who made this happen. To our speakers, we have 10 amazing state legislators who are here who are gonna share their views and speak with us. And we have a commissioner who flew in from California who is going to be speaking to us about their independent redistricting commission. And with that, it's time to hear from our state legislators. Um, we've, we are uh, very flexible today. And so actually our very first, first speaker, do we have um, Delegate Mark Sickles? Not yet. Okay. Um, do we have... Uh, Delegate Simon? Oh, yay! Here we go. Can everybody please give us a round of applause for Delegate Marcus Simon? Thank you very much. So I was asked to talk about, uh, I think we have nine more of us to hear from, so you guys are going to probably hear some of this more than once. So I'm going to try and be brief and to the point. I was asked to talk a little bit about the criteria bills that are going to be coming up this year. Uh, just to, by way of some first, a little bit of background, right? There's, there's a constitutional amendment that passed the General Assembly, both houses of the General Assembly last year, to talk about who is going to be doing the redistricting. It creates a commission. I won't get into the details of that because I'm going to leave that for somebody else. But the, the, the commission is going to be who does redistricting. The criteria bills, uh, this is legislation that's both enabling and I think complementary to the constitutional amendment, talks about how we draw the districts. Uh, and I think for me, how we draw the districts is as important, if not more important, than who does the drawing. Uh, and so uh, last year, the governor had a bill that he put in. Uh, it was carried by my colleague, uh, Marcia Price, on the House side. It was carried by Senator Jennifer McClellan on the Senate side uh, that addressed criteria. Uh, that didn't get, that was not as um, bipartisan. It wasn't as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not bipartisan. It wasn't, there's no, no consensus around that, right? That never, we never got to a compromise on criteria last year. So we got an amendment out, which we'll talk about, you'll hear about, uh, but we didn't get the criteria out. So this year we've got to do both, right? We've got to pass the exact same language we had in the addendum and get to the criteria. Um, one of the things that the criteria bill that I support, and I think a lot of uh, my colleagues support, uh, has to have in it, it's got to have, it's got to emphasize the role, I guess, of communities of interest, right? Um, right now the existing criteria uh, for, draw, for how you draw it talks about being contiguous, compact, uh, and having the right number of delegates in it, right? We gotta make sure that they're all about the same size. Uh, beyond that, we don't have a lot of guidance as to how to draw it. So we wanna make sure that we emphasize the role of communities of interest, um, adding requirements that'll better protect uh, racial and ethnic communities, um, while also improving representation of other communities in Virginia. Uh, but we also wanna be careful that we define political parties and like-minded politically people as not being explicitly not being communities of interest. Like you can't say, oh, what? we're gonna draw all these Democrats together because that's a community of interest. We wanna make sure that that language isn't allowed to happen. So some of it's what you can consider and then some of it's gonna be the criteria about what you can't consider, which would be political data, the, the, the political parties and the partisanship. Um, and so prohibiting drawing of lines to favor or disfavor any party or incumbent. Um, that's the other thing you wanna be careful of. I, I think one of the first things I heard in my first League of Women Voters redistricting forum not quite 40 years ago, many years ago, was the idea that you don't have uh, the voters picking, uh, you don't have politicians picking their voters, right? The, the way democracy is supposed to work, it's supposed to be the other way around. Voters get to pick their politicians, not politicians picking their voters. Um, and then we need to figure out a way to define uh, compactness uh, in a way that allows for respecting the other criteria while um, preventing sprawling districts. It's funny, I know you guys put up a picture, Senator Marsden's here, but you guys use a picture, he's seen it I'm sure, so I'm not breaking any news, a picture of Senator Marsden's district that kind of goes like that. And under the Voting Rights Act, that meet, and under our, our, our Virginia Constitution, that met the definition of compactness. So to a lot of us looking at it, it didn't seem very compact. So one of the challenges in a criteria bill is gonna be defining compactness in a way that all those things can happen together. Uh, one way to do that, and I think one of the ways that Virginia 2021 likes is to sort of, your first way of looking at it is let's look at where the existing political 
subdivision boundaries are, right? That's sort of a community of interest right there. There's Fairfax County and Fairfax City. Does Fairfax City need to be chopped into four different parts? Um, or probably is it better to try and keep the city of Fairfax together for various reasons? So that's you know, sort of one place to start, but the, the battle, I guess, is going to, I don't say battle, but the discussion is going to be, the discussion is going to be over, you know, which of those things sort of get priority. Do we go to sub political subdivisions first? Is that the be all end all? Or when we talk about what a community of interest is, do we consider that, hey, for whatever reason, maybe historically that line was drawn, but there's a historically African American community like in Falls Church City, for instance, that exists south of Route 50 and Lee Highway in the James Lee area and also north. And do we split that community up so that we can respect that political boundary? Or is it better that that real community of interest, that historical community stay together in one legislative district? So that's going to be the trick, I think, to, to solving the criteria puzzle. Um, there's going to be, again, a lot of discussion about that. Um, I, I think for many of us, um, we were a little bit disappointed that we went forward with the amendment last year without getting the criteria as well, because because it, it, it has to work together, right? And who picks it uh, is important, but what their rules are uh, when they go out to sit and do all those boundaries is going to be important, particularly since the, the, the amendment we have requires these, and again, some of these super majorities to pass, and there's a distinct possibility that a lot of us have recognized that you don't get to that consensus, it goes to a court to draw, and we want the court to have some pretty clear, if it were to get there, even, even among the members, it's less likely that you get to a log jam if everybody sees what the rules are, and the rules in the criteria bill kind of limit the opportunities to be too, too creative um, in, in trying to protect incumbents and other political types. So with that, I know you guys have a lot of people to hear from, uh, but that's sort of the criteria in a nutshell. Where we are with it is we didn't pass anything last year, so we've got to get it this year. Um, what we do first, whether we do the amendment first or the criteria first, I think probably we'll have to get criteria that everybody can live with before we decide to go to this commission, if we decide to go there at all. So with that, I think I'm supposed to hand it off to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have, a, we have time to take a quick question or two, that's okay, to a quick question or two? If you can raise your hand, I'm here on the mic. We've Hi, I'm Larry Rudwick. Um, I, I like that you uh, talked about the quote that Barack Obama said there. So my question is, is the politicians going to pick the, um, the districts or is the voters? Well, so, and that goes to the makeup, and some of that's sort of you know, where we are now. The, the who picks, right, is, is in the constitutional amendment. We're sort of stuck with that language right now, and it's a mix of citizens and legislators. I know there was a version that was originally put in last year that would have gotten the politicians out of it completely, um, but the, the prevailing wisdom was we want the legislators, some of us anyway, uh, to have a role in that. Uh, but again, I think if you have the right criteria, you know, it doesn't really, for me, if you have the right criteria, it's, they're clear, they're easy to follow, it's objective, everybody can see. You can go back and justify your map and say, hey, this is how we got to this shape. Um, it wasn't because Marcus lives here and Rip lives here and Kathleen lives here and we want to keep them all apart. It was because you know, these communities of interest exist. This is where the boundary was. This gets us to this number, which is plus or minus 1% of what we have to be. Um, and it meets all these other criteria. And I think who drew it that way becomes less important if we've got a defensible map. Um, you know, I would have loved to see competitiveness in there, but it's sort of hard to do competitiveness, which I, mean, I guess there's always a question, what are you hoping to get from nonpartisan you know, redistricting? What is the, the goal of the exercise? I think for some people, it's like, well, we don't want incumbents just automatically being reelected all the time. Uh, I don't know that you'll get that. I mean, if you respect political boundaries in the city of Falls Church, you're gonna have Democrats every time, right? I mean, it's a pretty blue uh, neighborhood. Uh, but on the other hand, Right now, based on the election results, if you wanted to have a competitive district, you'd, you'd have to draw one that looked like Dave's but went even further out. Um, so, you know, I, I think competitiveness isn't necessarily a necessary criteria. It may be a result of some of what we do, but I think the criteria we need to focus in on are making sure we don't uh, continue to do things that we've done historically in Virginia um, in the past that we aren't really proud of, which is to dilute uh, the votes of certain minorities to keep them out of power. Uh, that's a big no, no, something we're trying to avoid, uh, or drawing them for incumbent protection purposes that don't really make sense uh, to anybody. Is there one, one more? Uh, I'm just asking uh, with regards to precincts and when the, the new districts are drawn, from a timeline perspective, Fairfax, I believe the counties have the right to do the precincts. So would they have to do their redrawing of precincts prior to the 
congressional and state and delegate uh, or Senate and delegate uh, districts being done or can they be done at the same time in parallel? Uh, you know, that's a mechanical question that I, I honestly don't, I'm not super familiar with. I know that one of the issues though of splitting precincts is something we're going to try and avoid. Uh, we've had a problem in Fredericksburg, Stafford area with, between Mark Cole and Josh Cole now two elections in a row, even though we knew this was a problem, that people were getting the wrong ballots, and yet the registrar couldn't manage to not hand out about 40 or 50 of the wrong ballots, um, and told us, well, it's done now, we can't, <laughs> nothing we can do about it now. The good news was we didn't have such a close margin uh, this time around. But yeah, we're going to certainly need to, as part of the larger redistricting effort, I think between the state and the localities, make sure we have good coordination um, so that they're drawing their precincts and we're drawing our districts and we can avoid to the maximum extent possible. Believe me, Vivian Watts uh, will tell you, she wants to make sure we avoid split precincts. She wants my Camelot houses back. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of other people that I know need to talk, but you want to, well, we just the last but that's my constituent, Renee Andrews. So I have to yeah. recognize Renee. <laughs> and also on my electoral board, so I really need to make sure she's happy. Thank you. I'm speaking as Renee Andrews, Secretary of the Electoral Board in Falls Church, and I can answer that. Our precincts are frozen until after redistricting. We get, we get frozen in, in, the, in the year that ends with a nine every 10 years, and we're frozen until two years later. So after the redistricting is done, then localities can re-precinct. Great, thank you for that. We really appreciate that. We've got such a knowledgeable audience. Um, so let's all please give a round, uh, a big thank you to Delegate Simon. Thank you so very, very much. And now let's please give a warm uh, welcome to Delegate Mark Sickles. There we go. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Sickles. This is my, ended up my 16th year on the Privileges and Elections Committee. And I've seen all kinds of uh, legislation on this matter over the years and have voted for uh, nonpartisan, bipartisan uh, redistricting all the way through. Um, the, the bill, as I know most of you in 2021, the resolution that we passed last year is not ideal. Uh, there's no way anything would have passed the House on its own. So this came out of the Senate as a compromise 40 to nothing. Um, there, are, there are things about it that make people in the House nervous. And that uh, mainly is uh, the way the disputes are resolved at the Virginia Supreme Court, which has been appointed by not people of my party, but people of the other party. And, and what it means when we fail to agree six of eight. I'm sure you all know what the resolution does. The resolution has 16 people, uh, eight politicians, four of each party, and eight citizens, and six of the eight have to agree on a plan. Uh, what makes some people nervous is that if all four Democrats or all four Republicans uh, don't want to agree to a plan, it would go to the court automatically. How does the court handle that. Um, there's going to be a criteria bill, as, uh, as Marcus uh, Delegate Simon mentioned, I've got a bill to, pro to put some boundaries on how the Supreme Court handles that. So it would reflect how the federal courts handle it when they have a dispute like this. For instance, 11 of our House of Delegates districts were found to be unconstitutionally drawn in 2011. It took eight years of litigation by plaintiffs, not our caucus, but outside plaintiffs, to get resolved that you can't pack African Americans in a district and that you're lowering, lowering their uh, uh, influence in, so in society and their opportunity by doing so. So we had new districts in this immediate past election, which, and, uh, which brings me to the biggest thing it, that affects how a southern state that's subject to the Voting Rights Act has to do this. We have to comply with the Voting Rights Act. Uh, you know, Section 5 was uh, tossed by the Supreme Court, meaning our preclearance went away. So now we can do it without preclearing it, but the law is still there. Someone can still sue us if we don't comply with the Voting Rights Act. And over the years, even though the language in the 1965 law looks clear on its face, it, it has had a, differing, a different application in the courts. Today, and this is what is going to drive uh, redistricting, uh, more than communities of interest or contiguity or any of those things, is compliance with today's interpretation of the Voting Rights Act, which means you have to do a racial voting block analysis in every single district. You can't, what we did in 11 and what uh, our majority leader made clear on the floor when we were, um, when that was uh, 
being considered was putting 55% of African Americans voting age uh, population into districts across the board. You can't do that. And so um, uh, that, dis no matter where the boundaries are, what jurisdictions you are, you have to allow African Americans to select the voter of their choice. And that is different in every district because you can, in many districts, have a black voting age population of 30%. That can determine the primary. The person who wins the primary can win the general election. Political scientists can do this. I can't do the math on that. But the gentleman who redrew our 11 illegal districts, he does this for a living. He's a professor at University of California, Irvine. He's done many states. And uh, so that's what you have to get by first. And nothing we do at our level can undo the federal law. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have a good criteria bill. And there is, with this Supreme Court we have now, I guess the possibility that the whole, that they could discover that there's no more need for the Voting Rights Act anymore and could strike the whole thing down. And if that happened, I would hope that we would have a similar uh, protections against packing minorities of any kind in, into districts. So um, I'm, I came today because George Barker can't be here and he asked me to come and uh, he was the one who developed this plan that they have. I will, uh, will say that there is, and Delegate Simon inferred this, in a legislature we work by, uh, it takes a long time to get good at this, you know, we're only there for six or eight weeks a year. And uh, it took me a long time to learn how to do this, and I'm not sure I've, I've got there yet, but gotten there yet. But um, we uh, um, uh, we work by seniority, and and any legislature does that. Generally speaking, sometimes you'll see somebody without seniority jump over other people for various reasons, or they might not want to uh, uh, rise to the chairmanship or something. But if we had um, a minority person just Let's just take this as a uh, uh, stipulate this, who had been around uh, forever representing that district, finally became uh, ability to uh, chair a committee in a district that had, uh, you know, had some issues or they were impoverished or they needed more government help than others. And then we say, oh no, we're going to have a bipartisan commission draw her out of the district or draw him out of the district after all these years and either force that person to move or um, or just not run for re-election. And I don't really think that's in the interest of the community that he or she has represented all these years. So there is some value if we're going to operate uh, by seniority, which is helpful to have a functioning government because we're all volunteers. We're, we're civic uh, volunteers here. We get paid less than $18,000 a year. So we're not here making a lot of money. We're trying to do good. And so there is some benefit to having people who have been there before stay in the district that they're in now. So um, I make that plug. I think that was one of the factors, maybe not the only one, but one of the factors behind Senator Barker and Senator Sasslaw's idea on having political influence on one side, but limiting it to one half of the commission. So I'd be happy to take, a, a, uh, take questions. Uh, I agree that we need to get a criteria bill and some more instructions to the court. Uh, done this year before we consider the resolution for its second reading. There's always an opportunity to go back to um, a bill that's passed the Senate before uh, called the Iowa Plan. If you're study or up on this issue, you know that Iowa uh, in some quarters is considered a gold standard, uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan way to approach redistricting. Um, Iowa doesn't have the not subject to the Voting Rights Act and doesn't have the diversity that we have, uh, so it may not be an ideal thing, but it is consistent with our current Constitution, and we would not have to necessarily amend our Constitution to draw fair districts. Does that spur a question anywhere? <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, my name is Will Hayward. Um, I guess I'm just a little concerned when I hear nonpartisan and bipartisan being used interchangeably. Um, so my concern is pretty much that um, anything that would have any chance of passing in a bipartisan way would 
largely serve to um, serve for incumbent protection, especially since, as the previous speaker noted, uh, competitiveness doesn't seem likely to become a criteria. How would any sort of redistricting effort uh, not just simply become uh, incumbent protection if it's being done in what must be a bipartisan manner? Well, as I was just saying, I don't think it's, I disagree with you that we should have a totally, take the politicians out of it totally. For me, in my district, I'd be fine. I would run wherever the law, if you were a citizen drawing the lines, I'd run wherever you drew the lines. But I was making the case that in a system like ours, where so this isn't legislature, it's good to not draw people out of their district sometimes. So when I said bipartisan and nonpartisan, I was just saying that I've heard, I've heard all approaches and had different approaches to that. And I, I, in a perfect world, it would be nonpartisan. You know, someone would draw the maps, but we have the Voting Rights Act, which is gonna prevent you from doing that. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. Does this bill require two readings, two votes? Yes, ma'am. And we passed, the uh, constitutional amendment requires a House of Delegates election in between the first and second passage of the resolution, and that's where we are today. So we have to pass it in the exact same form this January. Criteria, though. Uh, what happens to that? Well, that's, that's going to be the subject of a lot of debate in this winter session. Because we have, not pa we have not passed one on our side. We would like to see a criteria bill that gives direction to whoever ends up drawing these districts. And, but that will be debated. Uh, Doug and Simon talked about that. But unlike the constitutional amendment, you guys vote on it and it either passes or fails, right? Yes, ma'am. It's like any bill. The House passes, the uh, Senate passes a version possibly. Maybe there's only one House that passes it. The other side rejects it. We go into conference and we work it out just like any other bill. And it goes to the governor. And the legislative process is not over until April, everybody, because the governor plays a strong role in our constitutional system here in Virginia. Yes, sir. Uh, you referred to the... Uh, this is my last question. You referred to the Iowa approach as being a gold standard. Some people say. And, and, and you really ought to underline some people about 13 times. Okay. Because the Iowa approach only works because they have a separate part of their legislative support uh, organization that is protected by decades of, uh, of prior experience and, and allowed to operate in a nonpartisan manner. The legislature lets them alone so they can draw the maps in a nonpartisan manner. They're trying to replicate that process in any other state where you have a lot of uh, unfavorable dialogue between two parties would never work. Well, um I get like a question for you. Uh, is there a state that you like a lot? Because please send it to us so we can look at if there's any if there's any alternatives to this constitutional amendment. That's number one. Number two, Virginia is if any state could do what Iowa does on that score. Our legislative services department is completely uh, bipartisan. They they work for Republicans. They work for Democrats. It's not like Capitol Hill. Ledge Council downtown. They work for both sides, but the, both parties have their staff. In our case. It's all bipartisan staff, and they do have experts in this area and could draw a legal map. I can tell you that. Thank you so very, very much. Yes. Thank you, Governor Sickles. We do really appreciate that. And with that, please let's give a warm round of applause for Delegate Mark Keem. Thank you, Wendy. First of all, it is not true that every member of the house is named Mark, okay? It's Mark and Simon, Mark, Le Mark Sickles, Mark Kim, Mark Levine is here. I don't know who else. But there's an Abraham, so that's good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is good to see all of you, and thank you so much for giving up a part of your time on a weekend, especially at a very busy time as we're heading into the holiday season, that the fact that so many of you have showed up here today to learn and to talk and to share your thoughts about one of the most important parts of democracy gives me confidence that notwithstanding what's happening nationally, notwithstanding what's going on about 25 miles uh, east of here, 
our democracy and the citizens' voice in democracy is still alive and well, and I hope that you will continue to do that, because that's exactly what we need in this day and age. Now, we heard a lot about what's going to happen next year, and I will tell you the most important thing we're going to have to do next year, to be exact, on February 14th of 2020, in addition to celebrating with our loved ones Valentine's Day, we're also going to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the founding of the League of Women Voters. And uh, so I hope symbolically that by that date, which is right around the time when we're done with the House and then we'll be sending our bills to the Senate and vice versa, it's what we call a crossover, right around Valentine's Day of next year, I hope that we can deliver some very good news to you that not only have we passed a very strong, uh, well, passed the constitutional amendment as it came out without any changes, because that's what we need to do to make sure that you, the voters, have a chance to, to enact that into law, but then that we would have passed by that point a strong criteria bill. And you've heard from already from my colleagues that the criteria bill is really where some of the big uh, substantive changes we're going to have to have is going to be done. And I can sure, certainly uh, share some thoughts with you. But uh, let me start with a couple of caveats. Uh, number one, I'm not on the Privileges and Elections Commission Committee, which means that I don't have a front row seat at these conversations. I can certainly talk to my colleagues, but my friends like Mark Sickles and Sam Rasool and others who are going to take the lead on that committee and on the subcommittee, they are really the ones who are going to have the pen uh, to the document. So we want to make sure that they have all the support that they need. So uh, members like me and others who are not on that committee will be playing a role, but we're not going to be playing as active a role. And number two, I also want to just share with you that notwithstanding how things go, and you will see you know, different people's concerns, and I know Brian's here and others are here who are going to share a lot more about the nitty gritties. I want us to understand that this is a very, very, very difficult thing to do. And I don't mean difficult as in political or partisan or which side gets it. it I just mean that as a complex matter, as a policy matter, redistricting lines once every 10 years is a very, very, very difficult and challenging thing. And I can speak with a, a little bit of experience because I went through this myself. So I thought my, the best way I can spend my time today, uh, just a couple minutes that I have here with you, is number one, share a little background as to why we are even here and then tell you why this criteria language is really the more important part of this conversation. Because the heavy lifting, whether you like the bill that came out last year or not, the constitutional amendment, whether you like it or not, and I'm not crazy about it, frankly. If I could have written it, it would not look the way it does. But I had a one, one shot at voting yes or no, and I was going to vote yes for that. So unfortunately, we lost that battle as far as how much we could have negotiated. So the constitutional amendment has to pass as is, from my perspective. But the real fight's going to be over the criteria. How do we tighten the language? How do we add you know, the, in, the communities of interest, the competitiveness, all the other aspects that we need to put in there so that the, the criteria that we use is robust. But before we get into that conversation, I wanted to share a little uh, background because for many of you here who follow this work, and I know that uh, uh, 2020 and others who've done such an amazing job, and uh, one Virginia and others who've been advocating have probably uh, spent a lot of time teaching you. But for the rest of us who don't pay a whole lot of attention to this, I want us to think this back a little bit. And having these uh, four men here, the presidents who've served among the 45 who've been presidents, is a good reminder of how this issue is both a national and a regional and a local issue. And I want to start with this perspective. In 1965, when the Voting Rights Act of 65 uh, was enacted and uh, Lyndon Johnson was president at the time, the first year that we had to do uh, redistricting and then a census of, of course, a census counting and then the reapportionment and the redistricting that came as a result happened in 1970, right? So 1970 was census, 1971 was the first uh, redistricting. President in 1971 was Richard Nixon. So fast forward 10 years, 1981, the next census, next redistricting. President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Fast forward 10 more years, 1990, 1991. President of the United States, George W, uh, George H. W. Bush. Fast forward 10 more years, 2000, 2001, President of the United States, George W. Bush. It wasn't until this past 10 years ago, 2011, it wasn't until 2011 that America had a Democratic president at the time when the census and the redistricting happened. So the idea of the Voting Rights Act protecting minorities and people of, of color and making sure that their lives are protected through the democratic process it wasn't until 10 years ago that we actually had a Democratic president who happened to be an African-American and an attorney general who also happened to be an American, African-American, Eric Holder, that were supervising that review. And so in Virginia, one of the still the original uh, 65 Act states where the Voting Rights Act requires us to get uh, federal preclearance, 
My colleagues who wrote the bill in 2001, uh, 2011 rather, the special session, who were Republicans, there were 66 or 68 Republicans at the time, were 32 or 34 uh, members in the House, they were conscious, very conscious, that all eyes were on them and that they had to do this right because they knew that the Democratic White House and the Democratic DOJ with happened to be two African-American uh, gentlemen on the top of those uh, two agencies were overseeing what they were doing. So to their credit, and I say this with a little grain of salt, to their credit, the Republicans tried really hard to make something that wasn't going to end up in litigation because the last thing they wanted was to be a conservative uh, you know, southern state with Republican charge of drawing lines that looked like they were going to be, you know, affecting minorities and such. So the result of the bills that came out in 2011 during the special session, and I think some of us were in the House at the time, we, I, I'm one of the half of the Democratic caucus that voted for it, the other half voted against it, but at that time we were given one vote up and down, and at that time I felt comf comfortable enough, confident enough, given that atmospheric, that the Republicans felt like the eyes were on them, that every single litigation out there was watching them to see what they did, that they made the criteria as tight as they possibly could. At the same time, they tried the, in their mind to protect as many of the African-American uh, districts as they could. So just to give them a little bit of credit, Republicans did in their own goodwill effort to try to do something that they thought would pass muster. And we all thought maybe it does look okay. And half the caucus voted for it, half the caucus voted against it. It wasn't until a few years later when we saw the Supreme Court and other litigation that came from other states that opened the door to say, you know what, let's revisit the Virginia law. Because even though we thought 2011 we did a decent job, maybe there's some other ways to look at this now that we have more technology, more computer programs that allow us to be able to analyze better. And because the litigation came halfway through the decade, we are where we are today. And this year, for the first time, we have uh, run our House races, not the US federal, but the state House races, with a newly redrawn lines based on the knowledge that we gained in the last half a decade. And as a result, we now have a majority in the Democratic uh, control in the House and the Senate also flipped as well. So I want to provide that perspective because here's why. LWV and all of us here try to be as nonpartisan, nonpolitical as possible. And it should not, this should not be a partisan issue. In fact, we do have some Republican friends in the room who um, uh, are, are just as interested in seeing good government. So I want to start with the idea that nobody here has an agenda. We don't. We don't have a political agenda. This is just a hard thing to do. And no matter how hard we think that we've got the right uh, formula, we might think this is the best criteria, we might think this, there are going to be people on the other side who's going to accuse us of being wrong or being you know, maligning or mi misleading. But the reality is, I hope you understand as you go through this, that this is a very difficult thing to do. And there is no easy answer, because if Iowa was a perfect one, we would have adopted that. If California was a perfect one, Florida, I don't know, whatever state is, if there was a perfect system, we would have adapted that. But the fact is, people that do this professionally are still grappling with this, and the courts change their mind as well. So I want to start with that idea, because as we go into the 2021 session, a 2020 session and beyond, uh, we need you to hold us accountable, but we also need you to give us as much input as possible so that if we try our best to come up with a criteria that we believe is the right thing, and if you don't like it, please give us some ideas so that we can try to improve it. And uh, I hope by doing that, we can show in good faith that all of us, regardless of which party we come from, and whether we're holding the majority party or minority party, we are really trying to do the, do the right thing. And that's the reason why I think the criteria part is the most important thing. Because at the end of the day, what happened in 2011, uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up here, what happened in 2011 was, I was a freshman member, I just got elected. I was number 100 at the time, 99 thanks to Eileen coming in. Eileen Philicorn came right after me, so she became number 100. Uh, but we were literally so, fr so new in this job that we didn't know what, we, what the process was gonna be and redistricting only happens once every 10 years. And so by the time we got the bill, we had no criteria to compare from. All we were told was, yeah, we vetted this. We use all kinds of computer systems and so this is the best we could do. Well, since we didn't have a criteria to match what we were supposed to do, with what we've already done, we didn't have anything to judge it. So that's why we kind of went with, okay, I kind of think it's okay, so maybe I'll vote yes. I kind of think it's not good, so maybe I'll vote no. That's what we did. This year, in order to prevent us from having uh, newer members having to have that kind of like, you know, which way should we go, by having criteria ahead of time, solid objective criteria, we can base our vote on whether this we believe is, uh, meets the criteria or doesn't meet the criteria. That's why having the constitutional amendment passed this year in the exact order, giving you a chance to vote on it in November, and then for us to do the right thing by uh, adopting the criteria now is the way I think is the right way to go. So with that, I agree with everything else that was said by my colleagues. I thank you for your time, and I'll turn this over to my, uh, Wendy. Thank you. We do have time for
for one quick question. You almost made it up. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> no. Uh, only one, ha one hand anyway, so yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering whatever happened to all of the university plans. Uh, several Virginia universities came up with nonpartisan plans, and I wonder what happened to those. Well, what happened to those was uh, a lot of really smart people, students and others and citizens and professors worked really, really hard, and they gave us amazing information. But none of that was taken into consideration in the, in the legislative process because there was no reason to. I mean, in other words, the process did not allow them more than anybody else coming to a hearing and saying, I have some ideas, I want to speak. They got maybe a minute or two. I mean, we saw the paperwork, we saw all the data, but since we were not writing the bills ourselves, we weren't able to incorporate that in. But that's why having the criteria bill this time with the idea of having more information shared by the, the public at large will give us a chance to incorporate that as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Delegate Mark Keene. Thank you. And now please let's give a, round, a warm round of applause for Delegate Carrie Delaney. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Delegate Carrie Delaney. Um, I do want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this event on today and for all of you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us on such an important issue. So I've been asked um, to address, did the blue wave of 2017, which was the year I was elected, make redistricting reform possible? And I think the short answer is yes, but I'll be happy to expand on that just a bit. Um, you know, we, you've heard from some of my colleagues who have been working on this issue for a very long time. Some of my colleagues have been working on this issue possibly most of my lifetime. But, um, you know, so we know that we're, we're joining uh, colleagues that, are, that have been champions, and I do want to make that very clear. But I think that one thing that came in 2017 were a lot of, um, of new faces and new members who got involved in government, not because of their desire to affect politics and you know, be, be a politician, but for a desire to make their government better. I was joined by a lot of colleagues who were unhappy by what they'd seen happen in Washington and feel inspired to make a change that they wanted to see in their country and in their government. And I think that with that mindset that this new wave of members has brought is a very genuine desire to represent the people. I know that's what inspired me to run for my background working in human service of being an advocate of being a voice for people. I know that's at the heart of, of my desire to run for office. And I've seen that be quite a common thread that shared with many of the colleagues that joined me after the 2017 election. So I think that um, not only were just the general numbers there to support you know, an issue that many of us talked about on the campaign trail in 2017 to say that we do support nonpartisan redistricting reform, but I think also uh, just the motivation of those numbers that joined us down in Richmond of being people who really want to do the right thing for the people. And I think, you know, you, you all being here, we share this value. Hearing from my colleagues who've been working on this issue for, uh, for years gone by, share this value that we, we do recognize that you know, this, this is an important part of our democracy, that you pick your leaders and not the other way around. Um, so it's a real honor to be in Richmond representing you and, and uh, having an opportunity to join my colleagues in championing nonpartisan district reform. Looking forward to this coming session where I hope we can get some really great things done. Thank you for having me. Uh, Marcus Simon, I have a technical question. It could be for anyone because I don't see any of the upcoming speakers will be able to address it. Um, one way or the other. A technical question, the criteria bill, does it have to pass in 2020? Looking at the criteria, the, you know, the census isn't even done until 2020, reporting. So the criteria bill, does the legislature have flexibility to do it this coming year or the year after, or are we the voters supposed to know what the criteria will be before we vote in next November? So it's a technical question, and whoever can answer it, I'd appreciate it as we go through this. Sure, and, and I know I've got some colleagues who are saying I, I, they have answers to that. <laughs> so I'd be happy to, to yield some time to that. Um, the, the quick technical answer is we need to pass it in 2020 because all laws go into effect in July of that year. So if we pass something in 2020, it goes into effect July 2020, which means by 2021 when we start in January, we have the criteria in, in law. 
if we pass it in 2021, it doesn't go into effect until July, we're done with redistricting by then because we'll be in special session. That's the reason why technically we should do it. Now, we could always pass it as an emergency matter, but that also then puts us in a situation where we're kind of you know, in the middle of a, a session and we don't even know what the criteria is going to be. So the sooner we do the criteria, the better it is. Thank you, thank you, uh, Delegate Keem. I think um, you know, we, with with all things in Richmond, I find you know we, we have always a bit of flexibility, but it is such a tight schedule that we operate on that I think the more you know we're going to take this as a very serious issue this coming session, knowing that you know there are emergency measures, there are special sessions that can be called, but um, I hope that we can work hard and, and find some consensus this coming session. Any other questions for me? Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so very very much. And now please welcome Delegate Rip Sullivan. Thank you, Wendy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the first thing I want to do is welcome or thank the League for, uh, for having us here today. I know Wendy said they've been working on it for, what'd you say, 40 years? Um, I, I can tell you that when I got into the General Assembly five years ago, uh, and stood in front of audiences like this, um, or smaller audiences, you know, neighborhood civic associations, whatever it was, uh, and started to talk about redistricting. I could see the eyes rolling back in the head. I could see people nodding off. I mean, it just wasn't an issue that really was at the top of many people's agenda. But between the work that uh, the League has done, and I know Brian's here somewhere, Brian Cannon, uh, and his colleagues at One Virginia 2021, over the course of the last five years, this issue, to my way of thinking appropriately so, has rocketed up the list of issues that are animating Virginia's voters. Uh, and we certainly saw that, at least in my experience, uh, on the doors during this just, just this past election. So five years ago, not so much. Now it's a crucial issue. And I just want to congratulate the League and One Virginia 2021 for for doing such hard work over the course of the last five years to be educating people, making this issue uh, rise to the top. I, I was asked to talk about the challenges and the opportunities uh, for the next session in terms of redistricting reform or for redistricting reform. Let me start with the opportunity. Uh, you've heard all of us talking about the constitutional amendment. We can talk through all the details of that. But the fact of the matter is that if we want to do this as a constitutional amendment, and I think of it as it's important to do it that way, regardless of what they might do in Iowa and other states, because we are making a decision not just for 2021. We're making a decision for how our children are going to do it in 2031 and how our, their children are going to do it in 2041. We are amending the Constitution and saying, here's how Virginia is going to do this going forward. So the opportunity is now. This is really the only opportunity for another 10 years to amend our Constitution and affect the way we draw districts in Virginia. And as you've heard the technicalities of it, we have to pass the very same constitutional amendment language that passed last year uh, in order to put this before the voters again next year. Let me quickly answer, add another bit of uh, uh, response to this gentleman's question about do we have to do it. Um, this year. I think as a practical matter, forget about emergency sessions and when bills come into effect. As a practical matter, we have to do the criteria bill this year because what you've heard all of my colleagues say is that really the fate of the constitutional amendment really rests on whether the General Assembly is able to come to some conclusion about the criteria bill. They're joined. Right? The constitutional amendment, just as a constitutional amendment, I think has got very different chances than it does if it's passing in the context of criteria that, that the General Assembly has agreed to. So what's the opportunity? It's right now. And it's our only opportunity for a decade. What are the challenges? There are a lot of political challenges. Uh, you've heard again a lot of my colleagues talk about some of the nuts and bolts of criteria bills and what they're, what they're, um, what's going to be required. Uh, I look at it a little differently. Uh, and just to think of sort of the, 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 the meta challenge that this bill faces. And it's the bill it's the challenge that this idea has always faced. Its biggest challenge is to convince a bunch of politicians to give up some of their power, right? <laughs> to give up some of their power. And that's a hard sell, whether the Republicans are in charge or whether the Democrats are in charge. And what I've been saying since I got involved with this issue is, this is a bipartisan bill 
or should be at least, a bipartisan bill because both parties have been equally guilty of it over the years, right? Yep. Now, we all have... We all have our, depending on which side of the aisle we sit on, we all have our complaints about whether one side's done it more or worse than the other side's done it more or worse. But the fact is both sides have done it. The challenge for this bill is to convince legislators to give up power. Now, one of my colleagues said it, I, I can't remember which one. I, I wouldn't have written this bill this way. Frankly, I don't think Brian, I, in fact, I've introduced one of Brian's bills and it wasn't written this way, right? Um, this is not a perfect bill. And, you know, the very first thing I learned when I got to the General Assembly is you're going to wait a very long time to see a perfect bill. Uh, so this is not a perfect bill. I have my concerns with it. Everyone has their concerns with it. But the question is we are weighing one lousy way of doing things against, in my view, a less lousy way of doing things. Um, and the first thing is, of course, the legislators will be still involved. And that's a compromise that uh, the General Assembly reached last year. Um, so the key to this is going to be putting guardrails around the, the, it's what you've heard described as the, as the uh, criteria, the criteria bill. Guardrails around what this commission, how this commission does its work, how the, how the Supreme Court would uh, do its work, should, God forbid, it ever get in front of the Supreme Court. And I say God forbid not because of taking a shot at the Supreme Court, but I would like to think that the way the commission is set up and the magnifying glass that's going to be, the spotlight that's going to be on this commission uh, in another two years, that they're going to do their jobs and come up with a plan that is indeed uh, a good plan for all of Virginia. So th to me, uh, asked to, d to uh, identify the biggest challenge, that's it. You're going to have to come to Richmond and write letters. I think there's some postcards being written, um, trying to convince people to change the way it's been done for centuries. Centuries is too long, decades. Well, centuries, yeah, it is centuries. Um, and have people give up power. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard, gonna be a hard thing for my party to do. We just got power, right? Just getting ready to start. But in my view, we're gonna have to give up a little bit of it because it's just the right thing, not only for 2021, but for 2031, 2041, and going forward. So I'd be happy to take questions. That, those are my answers to the question I was posed, Wendy, the challenges and the opportunity. Yes, sir. You raised something right off the bat about uh, the change from rolling the eyes in the back of their head to uh, more uh, important awareness of this issue. Um, the volunteer I volunteered for one Virginian and spoke to hundreds of voters over the course of the last year or two. Uh, most of them understood there was an issue. So it wasn't the League of Women Voters so much, or it wasn't one Virginia necessarily that was starting this. Most people did. What do you think, in, from your viewpoint, um, are the reasons, the one, two best reasons why this has changed from rolling their eyes in the back of their head to an awareness? Uh, my, my view, that my answer to the question is it's, it's just simple political organization and activism. You're right. I mean, I, I think in Virginia, in, in Virginia, it's, I think it's fourth grade when you learn about gerrymandering, right? Uh, you learn about what it, its origins up in Massachusetts and whatever his name was, Jerry somebody or other. Um, <laughs> So people know it, people know it's a problem, but you know, there's a difference between voters knowing something's a problem and, and voters having a way to express that and channeling that, uh, that concern in a way that gets politicians questions. And unfortunately in today's world that involves money. One Virginia 2021 has done a lot of fundraising which has helped them create a, they've got a brilliant staff and they put together a board of directors of really, really smart people who, who knew a lot of people around the state. So it was, it, it's not so much, they didn't invent the issue, obviously. They didn't, they didn't, uh, uh, they weren't necessarily the first people to raise it with voters, but they created an organization and a strategy for having it become a really potent and important uh, political issue, which look, you got 11 legislators here, right? Who are all interested in it. So it, that, that's, that's what I meant when I said that. Anybody else? Last question. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Hey, Rep, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. 
Um, and I do think the league and One Virginia, um, working hand in hand, have done a, a fantastic job of getting the word out. I mean, hundreds of volunteers have spoken with thousands of voters, and it's, I really think it's bearing fruit, and the legislature has been very aware and, and, and great on this issue. Uh, my question for you is this, when you go back um, to Richmond, which criteria are you going to be working to get in that criteria bill? Thank you. Uh, Mark talked a little, all, all the Marks have talked about it so far, right? <laughs> um, you know, it's communities of interest, it's compactness. Uh, was it, uh, see a prices bill as communities of interest, very important. Um, you know, uh, I think it was Mark, Mark Sickles who talked about competitiveness, and I think it is true. I, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but you know, the idea here, forget about the idea, the effect here is not going to be, no matter what criteria, you're not going to draw, in the case of the House of Delegates, 150-50 districts. That, that just can't be done in certain parts of the, of the state. Um, you're not going to be able to find a district that's got 50% of people who you think are going to vote Democrat and 50 who you think are going to vote Republican. But what you want is fairly drawn districts that aren't drawn purposely to try to grab people way over here uh, that are one party or another um, and exclude people over here because you, you're worried they're going to vote the wrong way. So the words you hear so much about, are, words you hear a lot about that in terms of, of criteria are contiguity, things that are near one another. Uh, everyone's seen the district, I think it's in North Carolina, which has got sort of a, it's a barbell district, right? You got a, a big circle here and then, and then it's joined by a little thin, thin, you know, one mile line and then another city or something, right? These two, they have very little in common, except they might all vote one way. Um, so contiguity, compactness, uh, those kinds of things, uh, so that the court, uh, or the commission first, and then if it comes to that, the court, will have those criteria, and will have to comply with that c criteria um, uh, in drawing those lines. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. And now please join me in welcoming Delegate Mark Levine. Thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting us here. I'm Delegate Mark Levine. I represent Alexandria, Ar uh, Peace of Arlington, and Peace of Fairfax. And I strongly oppose gerrymandering. I think that the people have a right to choose the representatives and not vice versa. And because I strongly oppose gerrymandering, wait for it, I strongly oppose this constitutional amendment. Now, I'm the discordant voice in the room. I'm the odd man out. I realize that. I got a lot of convincing of my colleagues to do. I got a lot of convincing of you to do. But I've never run away from uphill battles. I think this constitutional amendment, if it becomes law, I fear, will gerrymander Virginia worse than it's ever been before and in a way that we can never stop it again. And the reason I believe that is because this right here, this lovely, lovely picture by the League of Women Voters, it's, it's, it's not right. It says that the, the commission chooses, chooses the districts. That's not gonna happen. No, the Virginia Supreme Court is gonna choose the districts. And the reason is if you read the bill, if you read the bill, it says very clearly, if two, two Republican legislatures, it, it, it's three um, for some, but it could be two in one house. If Todd Gilbert and Kirk Cox don't like this plan, it's dead, dead, dead on arrival. It goes right to the Virginia Supreme Court. All it takes is Kirk Cox and Todd Gilbert or pick the two Democrats you want to pick. And this plan is dead. That's what the bill says. It's not what 121 started with. It's not what George Barker started with. But that's the constitutional amendment before us. And I don't like it. And I've come to not like it. I've read it more carefully. We only had it for a few minutes before we voted on it. They changed it. it look. The, the bill very clearly says, if the commission cannot agree, and remember, it requires six of eight legislators. It doesn't matter if all the citizens agree. It doesn't matter if six of the legislators agree. If Todd Gilbert and Kirk Cox say no, the plan is dead and it goes to the Virginia Supreme Court. So what's wrong with the Virginia Supreme Court? Well, the Virginia Supreme Court is one of two courts in the United States, two state courts chosen by the General Assembly. This particular Virginia Supreme Court, every single one of them was chosen by an illegally gerrymandered Republican majority. Every one of them. They all serve 12 year terms. And if you say to me, well, but maybe they're good people, and maybe they are. 
Let me tell you who the last justice chosen was. It's the sister of a sitting Republican senator. Oh, but what about the one before that? Because I was there for two. The one before that was the right-hand person of Ken Cuccinelli, who wrote his opinions. And if you love Ken Cuccinelli, you know, you might love this Supreme Court. And look, look, I'm a partisan Democrat. No, there's no question about that. But I do want fair lines, and there are fair ways to do that. Uh, my own model, and I'm, a, I'm okay with the Iowa model, the California model, my own model, frankly, is the one they brought to the United States Supreme Court. It's the efficiency gap model in response to the Wisconsin case. I won't go into a lot of detail unless you ask me questions about it, but the heart of it is don't let anybody decide. Let computers decide. Statistically, you can require fair districts and get all these politicians and judges out of it. That's my personal preferred way of doing it. And I'd like to see that enacted. And you know what? We can enact that. But to do that, it's not for this constitutional amendment. So that's not the way to go. We can do it. We can do it by law. We can pass a new constitutional amendment, stick it in our constitution, get all the politicians out of it. But the Virginia Supreme Court, if you wonder if they're not partisan, they voted four to three to stop Terry McAuliffe from pardoning, not pardoning, from giving voting rights to all the ex-felons, even though it's right here in the Virginia Constitution that he can. And they said, four to three, it's never been done before, you can't. And that was before these two more partisan judges are on. And by the way, a third justice on the Virginia Supreme Court was a former Republican delegate. So that's three. And by the way, how many Virginia Supreme Court justices are from Northern Virginia? The answer, everybody? Zero. Zero. How many of the 11 Virginia Court of Appeals justices are from Northern Virginia? Arguably one from Prince William County, none from Loudoun, none Fairfax, none Arlington, none Alexandria. We're about a third of the state. The question for me is do we want the dead hand of the 2011 badly illegally gerrymandered Republican majority to control the Virginia districts, not just in 21, but in 31, 41, 51, and 61, because you know what, we can't stop them. And you know why we can't stop them? Because the court is chosen by the legislature, which is chosen by the court, which is chosen by the legislature, which is chosen by the court, and that's a loop we cannot break out of. I don't care if we elect the bluest governor in the world, the governor is shut out. I don't care if we elect the bluest legislature in the world, we try, but you know how gerrymandering works. And think about, let's think about the guy who's Ken Cuccinelli's right-hand person. By the way, you know who he replaced? Judge Jane Maram Rausch of Fairfax, who was in Northern Virginia, who was appointed by Terry McAuliffe, who was chosen by Republican Dave Albo, bipartisan, very fair judge. They threw her out and they put this guy in, and we couldn't stop them a few years ago. So what if he wants to stay in office? Well, his best way of staying in office is to get people to vote for him again. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to vote for his renewal. I mean, I don't know. We'll see how he does for the next 12 years. Maybe he'll change, but I'm very skeptical of Ken Cuccinelli's soulmate. I am. I admit it. Call me cynical. <laughs> so he wants to stay in power. If he puts in a gerrymandered Republican majority, they can put him back in power, and then he can put them in back in power. And what do we do in 2031? Nothing. It's in our Constitution. We can't get lucky in one election and change it. No, it's in our Constitution forever. The only way to change our Constitution would be we'd have to win elections back to back in a heavily gerrymandered Republican majority legislature. That's hard to do. It was hard to get to where we are now. So call me cynical, but please don't call me Cassandra. You know who Cassandra was? Cassandra was the, the Greek, uh, the, the uh, person from Greek mythology who was cursed to always give bad news, but she was always telling the truth. I do not want my colleagues to come to me in 2022 when the Virginia Supreme Court does us a bad one and say, oh my God, Mark, you were right. I don't want to be right. I want to have fair boundaries. And there are ways to have fair boundaries. And the reason why I actually originally voted for this bill, now again, I only had 10 minutes, 15 minutes to see it before, and I had real qualms about it, actually, either way, before I voted, was because my colleagues said, as you've heard them say, we could fix it in the criteria bill. And I thought maybe we could. But I've looked at it more carefully, and I don't think we can. And the reason is this. No matter what criteria we put, if we have judges who aren't acting in good faith, they can just do whatever they want. Well, we can appeal to the United States Supreme Court. No, we can't. The final arbiter of state law and the state constitution is the Virginia Supreme Court. It is unappealable. 
If they do the wrong thing, we can't do a damn thing about it. So I'm really worried about this constitutional amendment. And I know that so many folks in this room worked so hard. I saw them. I saw them at the polling places. Virginia 121 worked so hard because they oppose gerrymandering, because you oppose gerrymandering, I oppose gerrymandering. This bill is not just not perfect, it is retrogressive, it is backward, it is worse than the current ugly system, it's worse. And I know what I'm saying is, 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 is different from what a lot of my friends are saying. I, I hope to persuade you, I really do. Uh, in fact, Brian Cannon and I are gonna have a nice one-on-one -on -one debate in Arlington, December 11th. I invite you to come. It should be very interesting. Bring all your friends. Um, let's not rush and say that because we fought so hard for so long and because so many good people want to end gerrymandering, we're going to do this thing that it's not really perfect. No, it's bad. It will harm us. Let's do the Wisconsin model, the Iowa model, Wisconsin, the efficiency gap model, that's my favorite, but the Iowa model, California model. Let's give this commission the power to draw the lines without going to the Virginia Supreme Court. But I just don't trust Todd Gilbert and, and Kirk Cox and Ken Cuccinelli's right-hand guy in the Virginia Supreme Court. Call me cynical. But please heed my voice. And now I'll take a question if I'm allowed. Yes, please. Oh. OK. I'm Sherry Zachary. I uh, want to ask you, well, which courts throughout the 2011 redistricting maps. It, it's my understanding that for the congressional districts, which is also drawn by the legislators, it went to the federal court, they threw it out, made, made the congressional districts be redrawn, and then there were delegate districts that needed to be redrawn. Wasn't it the Virginia Supreme Court that no. threw it out? No. And that's a great question, and no it was not. It was the federal courts. And the reason the federal courts threw it out was not because of political gerrymandering. In fact, the United States Supreme Court held this year, you can political gerrymander as much as you want, go forth and gerrymander, everyone gerrymander all you can, we're not going to do anything to stop it. That's what the United States Supreme Court ruled this year, to my dismay. I wanted this efficiency gap model that I thought was going to win Justice Kennedy. No, the courts who changed us were the federal courts, not based on political gerrymandering, but based on racial gerrymandering. The only gerrymandering that's thrown out in America today, under the law, is racial gerrymandering in violation of the Voting Rights Act. And that will remain, yes. And that's good. That's something. That's good. But it's not enough. Because political gerrymandering is absolutely legal and has just been blessed by the United States Supreme Court to my dismay, to my horror. So and the Virginia Supreme Court didn't touch it. It's only the federal courts, only on the Voting Rights Act. And I just pointed out that I don't trust the, the, the Virginia Supreme Court because they could choose us and we could choose them and they could choose us. And, and so I, I but, but to answer your question, it was not the Virginia Supreme Court, it was the federal courts under the Voting Rights Act. Yes. Can I take two more? Because there's two big hands here. Okay. Hi, my name's Carol. And I'm just wondering, so if we, um, if the amendment doesn't move forward and doesn't pass, then what do you envision moving forward? So I'm gonna put forward a bill this year that does the efficiency gap model, which I loved. It's really wonky, but I'd love to explain to all of you. It has to do with wasted votes. You should look it up. It's what they tried to persuade Justice Kennedy with. It basically lets the computer do the models, and then it equalizes the number of people who are unhappy. That's actually how it works. And by doing so, it actually it, it, it randomly draws fair districts, and then I'd have 1% to make sure that our districts are not too squiggly. But um, that's the bill I'm going to put forward. I'm not wedded to that. Uh, you know, the Iowa model is fine. A true commission where it doesn't go to the Virginia Supreme Court, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with lots of solutions. I just don't trust the Virginia Supreme Court. And that's hard to say because I hope they're good people and I hope I'm wrong. But I've just told you, you know, the composition. And I fear that the old illegally gerrymandered, racially gerrymandered for Republicans of 2011 can control us for decades to come and we couldn't do anything about it. But yes. My initial question was the same. Oh, okay. To hers, but you're on. Um, I also want to clarify the voting issue about how many legislatures would would have to basically hang the commission, based because it's um, not completely clear. Let me let me explain that. It was 16. No, okay. So the way it works is this: 
if every one of the citizens loves the bill, okay, and only five of the eight legislators love the bill, it dies. It doesn't go anywhere, it goes to the Virginia Supreme Court. In addition, if two legislators from the same body don't like it, it dies. So it only requires two delegates or two senators to oppose the bill of the same party or either, either maybe from the same party. Not, I don't think we get one from either party. But if, if, if two delegates oppose it, it's dead. If two senators oppose it, it's dead. I think that's a problem with the language of the bill. And look, I'm the kind of guy, my colleagues will tell you, I killed six unanimous bills last year. And I killed six unanimous bills. I mean, I mean, they flew through the House, they flew through the Senate, and I looked at the detail, found a flaw, brought it up, convinced a lot of my colleagues, and the governor vetoed it. That's six bills. I believe in the details. The details matter. Don't just support this constitutional amendment, please, because you hate gerrymandering. I hate gerrymandering, too. Support the constitutional amendment because you've read it, and because you understand it, and because you understand that two legislators can bring it to the Virginia Supreme Court and because you trust the Virginia Supreme Court. If you trust the Virginia Supreme Court chosen by the illegally gerrymandered Republican majority, then you'll be fine with this. I don't. Thank, thank you, everyone. I'd love to chat further. Thank you so very, very much. That's Delegate Mark Levine. And now it's my pleasure to bring up Delegate Ken Plum. Ken has been co-sponsoring and sponsoring a redistricting bill every single year since 1982. Let's please give it up for Delegate Plum. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you, and thanks to the League for all the good work that you've done in the past election and the work that you continue to do as we prepare for the legislative session. You know, I just arrived, my grandson was visiting at home, so I just arrived here, and I walked in in the middle of Mark's speech and thought to myself, my God, what have I got myself into? <laughs> so, with all the legislators who spoke before me and all the good things that they've said, I'm, I'm going blind in this, but it's not a subject I'm new to thinking about, it's a subject that's been on my mind for a long time. I was first elected to the state legislature in 1978, there were 78 Democrats in the House of Delegates, and we had the place locked up. Uh, over the course of time, however, that number eventually wound its way down to 32. Uh, we clearly lost the majority. But in the meantime, back when I first got underway, the Common Cause Organization was so involved in good government causes, and Common Cause is still around, but Common Cause seemed in the period of the early 1980s to be really active. And there was a gentleman in McLean, and it is a true story that his name was Charlie Brown. <laughs> Anybody know Charlie? No, too young a crowd. <laughs> Char Charlie passed away some years ago, but he was, a, uh, I think, a federal employee, but he was also a writer, and he was heavily involved in good government kind of causes like Common Cause was. And he visited me on several occasions to talk to me about the unfairness of the system as it operated. And the unfairness is one that you've heard defined many times, and that is the incumbents get to draw their own districts or their own constituents, and that kind of closes the loop, and could we do something about it? And he looked at and proposed what some other states had attempted to do. Iowa, I think, at that point had, had a program in place. And also, um, he had looked at what some of the political scientists had said might be a solution. Being a good government guy, I was very intrigued by this, number one, the definition of the issue, and the awareness, particularly in Virginia, how malapportioned our seats had become, and they weren't malapportioned simply to try to get Democratic dominance over Republicans, because Democrats clearly dominated the scene. But what they did is also they racially gerrymandered. So you had a whole segment of our population who was totally underrepresented. And so I agreed with Charlie that we would draft up a bill putting a commission in place uh, much simpler than the one that's before us now, but getting at the fact that you ought to have someone other than this legislators drawing these district lines. He also then did a couple uh, columns, uh, Ghost wrote some columns, what was the name of the countywide newspaper? The countywide newspaper that for Fairfax County before the journal newspaper? Was it the Globe? No. What was it? But anyway, you all are too young. I, I'm talking about that. But anyway, what we did, we did a couple of columns about the merits of having an independent redistricting commission. This was in 1981. Thank you, ma'am. 
you just keep a supply heading in there going, because I'm going to get wound up here in a minute. <laughs> I introduced that bill in the legislature that by then had 76 Democrats in control, and it went to the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee had, I don't know, remember exactly the number, but it was about 20 people on the Rules Committee, and 17 of them were Democrats. And I, as a Democrat, brought the bill and said to them, uh, gentlemen, we've been doing this wrong. Here's how we ought to do it. They all but physically threw me out of the room. <laughs> because the notion that incumbents get in their minds is that we have some kind of privilege. And when we get that privilege, we ought to be able to exercise it. And part of that exercising that privilege is to draw ourselves some safe district lines so we have less trauma come election year. Well, I think that's all well and good. But the fact of the matter is, from a good government perspective, trying to get okay, equal so. representation of all parties and so on is something we should strive to do. Okay. So I have tried to keep this issue alive over the years by reintroducing this bill many times. When the Republicans took over in 2000, I continued to introduce a version of the bill for an independent redistricting commission, and I would always go to the uh, commission and, uh, to, excuse me, to the committee to be heard in the Purpose and Elections Committee, and they'd say, oh yeah, now that we've taken over, you want an independent redistricting commission, and I'd whip out my old 1982 bill and say, no, I want you to do it back when we were in control, because it's the right thing to do. Now, as I suspect you've heard from the discussion going forward already, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I would say if I had my druthers, I would probably have a more straightforward, simpler method than we have before us. But the fact of the matter is it's a subject of compromise. And compromises, as people say, that's what a camel is. It's a committee working on something as a compromise, and it comes out looking like a camel. But the thing being is this. It, it's an opportunity for us to make a step forward. Will all the dire predictions that I just heard suggested that are going to happen in the court happen? We're going to meet every, every year as a legislature. We're going to go forward every year as a legislature. And I think, it's quite frankly, the time has arrived where we have to make a decision. It's inconvenient for me as a legislator with the thought that you could draw a district that would somehow disadvantage me. And it's an inconvenient thought. Gerrymandering, you know, is something that somebody else does to you, and you don't like that. But if you get to do it, and it makes your seat safe, then you feel a whole lot better about it, you call it good government. <laughs> but we as, we as incumbents, and I apologize to my colleagues who are here who may think this is blasphemy for to say this, is that we really can't draw the districts for our convenience. We really have to establish a criteria and establish a method going forward whereby we will be able then to know what we're up against and run our campaigns based not on the fact that we have a lot of good supporters stacked up, and that will make life easier for us. We really have to operate in a way where we service the people we th are there. I don't like the notion that we have talked about this bill for so long and talked about this approach for so long, thanks to Virginia 2021 and all the work that they've done to bring this to the public's attention, that we would now somehow get cold feet or we have somehow have second thoughts and that we would somehow walk away from the idea that we can do a better job of drawing legislative district lines. So I don't know that I have much more to say. Uh, I'd be happy to, to respond to questions if you have them or, or whatever. You don't have any questions to me. You, you, we talk all the time. <laughs> Teresa, Teresa, go ahead. Can we through every mic? So just yell that. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, I think that there's something that uh, none of you have addressed yet and it really occurred to me as I was sitting here because we have talked about the various standards and the compactness and the uh, community of interest. But no, but then somebody said, and the numbers, of course. But I'm sitting here thinking about, well, one of the things that has happened, when you look at any of these maps and you'll see the red over half of the state and the blue up here and there, um, the effect that the population changes in the state are going to affect some of the other standards, such as community of interest. Because, you know, we see that the districts in the red parts of the state, the southwest, et cetera, are going to be, have to be much larger. 
Well, they're much larger than, there's gonna be a lot of changes here in Northern Virginia and Richmond, et cetera. So what is going to be the effect on that? Will our community of interest in Reston, that you're my, my delegate, uh, I see that as getting much smaller because your people are gonna to have to be moving down. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to hear some discussion of the effect of the population changes on what the districts are going to look like and the possibilities of the changes because of that. Thank you. Well, you're, you've described it already. The districts in Northern Virginia will be pretty small. They can be districts you can walk across. Certainly you can drive across them in 10, 15 minutes. Downstate, you're gonna have districts that are five or six counties big, maybe even larger than that. I'm not sure exactly how large they will be. But it seems like the basic premise of this is equal protection of the law says you're gonna to have to have numeric equality. And of course, we've been using numeric equality to be within a percentage or point or two. And I don't see that going away and I don't know how you would have that go away. It does create a different circumstance for districts downstate that are larger in terms of communications. But that's less of an issue because we don't ride horses to go around our districts anymore. We've got different ways to get around our districts. So the concerns in the past about the districts being too large may have been ameliorated. I have, uh, when I was first elected, and some of you who were around then, although I don't think any of you were around then, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the way the, the, way the uh, state dealt with these large districts in Northern Virginia is they couldn't figure out how to cut them up. So I was first elected in the 18th district, had five at-large members. Uh, and I don't see going back to that kind of a system. In fact, the courts have thrown out that kind of system. That's how we finally got to single member districts. But this is not a simple proposition. Defining communities of interest is not simple. Having community interests happen to coincide with 80,000 people is not simple. It's something that requires a great deal of thought but it, the basic line of it shouldn't be that the number one criteria is gonna be whether or not I can get reelected. The number one criteria needs to be, as best as we can define it, people who have common interest and people who have equal protection and equal access to the law under that. It's difficult to do that. It's difficult to do that, but it, again, I think that's a task we've been given. Uh, we didn't ask for the job because it was an easy one. Uh, a lot of thought been, been given to how this might happen, and I don't have, currently have a better idea of how to do it, so I really think we have a commitment to go forward with what we have. One last question. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Would you be able to speak to the former speaker's answer regarding how just two people from either house could then kill the will of 14 other people on the commission? Uh, I will have to research. I heard that explanation, and I will need to look into it to see how he sees that, that happening. I don't share the overall um, uh, discomfort with the, the uh, state Supreme Court, even though that is appointed by the General Assembly, a political body. It, again, it goes back to the court system. If you're not going to do that, how are you going to get to fairness? I don't have an answer for that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Delegate Ken Plum. And now please, let's welcome Delegate Ibrahim Samira. Well, hello everybody. Hi. So, um, I'm no longer the newest delegate. <laughs> I appreciate it. I still am the youngest, so I, I'm going to give you a, a sort of a different lens of sort of how I think a lot of us are thinking about it, but I want to put it into words. Um, there was obviously a specific question that was asked to me. Uh, the question was, when did you first hear about redistricting reform and why do you support it? I think it's a pretty broad question. So I'll, I'll get a chance to talk about a few things. So, so from a personal perspective, from a background perspective, um, I, so I receive... Uh, Letters, obviously, of support of, of redistricting reform for many of you, um, especially my constituents. One constituent of mine, a 17-year-old, emailed me saying, I am disappointed I will not be having uh, another option aside from you uh, on the ballot uh, to, to vote for. And she said, while I agree with what you have to say, I really like what you have to say. I want another option so that you can become a better candidate. Well, I responded, 
uh, you know, if you want to uh, ungerrymander my district, it will probably become a deeper blue district, uh, and it will become an even safer quote unquote district uh, for the incumbent. And so I told her, uh, you know, I, I, I support your, your effort to try to create more competitiveness, but sometimes the areas themselves have coalesced around certain ideas uh, as we have in Northern Virginia. Um, you know, we're talking about technicalities a lot here, and I respect that conversation. Uh, I think that's for people that know more about the technicalities than I do. Uh, but I want to zone out a little bit. When we think about uh, the point of what we're trying to fight here, uh, the, the, the gerrymandering, the politicization of choosing uh, who your voters are, I think also about the Electoral College. Uh, I think about how the Electoral College also undermines the will of the people, the will of the majority. And, um, and when we think about the Electoral College, you know, it's obviously had some severe ramifications all across the country for us uh, in 2016. And that's because of the notion that a group of people sh shall be privileged over another in the voting process. That is, a, that is the, the basic premise of what we're fighting here. Uh, we see it happening in the Electoral College. We, we, it trickles all the way down to our state systems. And we see it happening in our state systems as well. When I came into the legislature, I heard about the, 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 uh, the, the plan to change the Constitution, to, to amend the Constitution, to have uh, our 16-panel uh, uh, person uh, uh, to, to choose our districts and to agree upon something, and then eight being legislators and eight being citizens, and uh, there being a decision-making process based on retired judges, I asked, the, the first question I asked was, well, do the retired judges have any vested interest? And I started digging a little deeper, and I found out that retired judges actually can still serve on the bench. They get paid a, a daily rate. Um, and I think as of a few couple years ago, uh, there was a law that was passed that they can be removed from, as retired judges, from being able to serve on the bench in their free time. So a lot of these judges, you know, obviously they've had long careers and it's, it's, um, I, I, I respect their civil service. They go travel, you know, they go across Europe and. And they come back to, to Fairfax, they come back to Virginia, and then, you know, they sign up and, you know, maybe they can get a day or two, maybe they can get two weeks, three weeks on, on the judgeship, and that'll make up for the, the salary, the amount of money they need so they can keep going traveling around the world. And um, so that's something that comes to mind, right? I mean, the system itself we have here is something to keep thinking about. Now, don't, let's not make... Uh, perfect enemy of the good, and let's try to pass some reform. So I support the amendment to the Constitution on the less, because obviously we're taking it a step further. But to think that your job is going to end in 2021, I think is a, is a uh, something to keep uh, keep in mind that is it's not going to end in 2021. Um, as, certain, as a 28 year old, I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm probably going to be dealing with it for a long time. <laughs> The idea that your judges are, are, uh, are part of this process uh, in a political fashion is, uh, and they're being viewed as uh, neutral entities is, uh, is a problem. Um, and it, again, we want to connect it all across the board to our whole system. So we want to think about how we have to keep broadening the strategy. It doesn't need to stop at Virginia. It, it, it's obviously a topic of discussion that has intensified in recent years. But 2016 and 2002, sorry, excuse me, 2000, showed us that the majority does not rule in this country. And that means that we need to be thinking about also the, the bigger problem that it's caused, the biggest problem it's caused is disenfranchisement of voters. Because at the end of the day, you have people who don't want to vote because their vote is worthless in their eyes. Um, when I was in college thinking about where would I want to live 
after college, I was thinking obviously Virginia. But one of the reasons I was thinking about is I want to be a public servant. And if I want to be a public servant, I want to be a place where I actually can contribute positively, not just to the very locality, but to the broadest audience possible. And at the time, Virginia was a swing state. And of course, now we know it's a little deeper blue with the last election. But point is, is that is, a, that is even part of the thought process of somebody who is trying to go into public service all across the country. We only have a few counties that swung the election in 2016. There are five counties. CNN was doing a special about them today. It's like Broward County, Milwaukee County, uh, Miami-Dade County. What are the other two counties? There you go. We can, we can name them. And that's our democracy right now. It's depending on a, a few counties across the country that swing left or right, depending on the year, and decide the fate of 300 plus million people. So let's continue to keep working on redistricting. I firmly stand with you and, and working against gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is but one part of the reform process. We need to continue all the way up to the Electoral College. We need to drive it all the way across to the point where we have voting rates, percentage participation, that at least meets the average participation in democracies across the world. Democracies across the world at minimum are somewhere around 60%, 70% participation in their, in their elections. We need to think about why we have off-year, off-year elections. We need to think about why we have an off-year election. All right, so those are two sets also on these odd years in, in Virginia as well that we need to fix. Because these communities of interest, as much as we want to include them in the maps and we want to make it fair, these communities of interest are still being harmed day in, day out by the overall system. So keep your energy high. <laughs> we'll be working hard. Thank you so very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. And now, please join me in welcoming Delegate Kay Corey. Good afternoon. I'm Kay Corey. I represent the 38th district, which is Annandale. And some people take offense when I say Greater Falls Church. But what I mean is physically the area outside of the boundaries. And I am delighted to be here. And I thank you very much for staying this long. I, my question was, what is the political atmosphere in the House of Delegates about this issue? But like a lot of people, I have a couple other things I want to say first. And I am going to, in a way, I think, add to some of the questions and concerns. I am supporting the constitutional amendment. I do not think it's perfect. I worry about its implementation and how, how unfair it possibly could be. But I have to tell you, what we have now is terribly unfair. And we also have a cycle of government that now's the time. And I would rather go to less unfair and than stay with terribly unfair. So those are my choices. And until I learn something else, I'm going to vote for this constitutional amendment. And I hope that you will when it comes your way. But I want to add a few things. We always talk about fair redistricting. Well, guess what? It's not fair. Do we count gender? How, how long have women been able to vote? Why is there a, a league of women voters? Why isn't there a league of all voters? Why isn't there a league of men and women and question mark voters? There isn't. The reason is because women wanted to vote and they weren't allowed to. So while we are dealing with racial gerrymandering and we are dealing with communities of interest or contiguous districts, we're not dealing with an awful lot of democratic factors. We're not looking at the serious, we're not, okay, let's say. Redistricting is based on numbers, not on voters. In my district, I have now between 80 and 90,000 people. I do not know the exact number of how many are registered voters. I do not know the exact number of how many are undocumented residents. 
None of those factors are being taken into account in redistricting. I'm not saying that there is a way to do it. I'm just saying, come on, realize, we're getting better, but we got a long way to go. And we have to keep at this, not just to perfect what we are going to implement, but to keep, be aware of the huge diversity that we're not taking into account when we redistrict. And we may not ever be able to, which means we all have to listen much, much more closely to the people that we represent, whether they voted for us, whether they're citizens, whatever gender they are. Once you're elected, you're responsible to everyone who lives in your district and also the whole Commonwealth. So please, people, realize this is a huge mountain to climb, and I am so happy that we are starting. But I don't think we're going to be really fair for, I don't know when, a couple generations, let's say, because then I won't be able to, I won't be here to find out if what I said is true. So I hope that you will all continue this. It's a lot of work. It's hard to be an active citizen and have any other life. We all know that. But you don't have a choice. Neither do I. So we're all here, and I hope we'll continue working together. And the best thing we're doing, besides maybe the constitutional amendment, is we're talking to each other. And that is what we have to keep on doing. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. That's Delegate Corey. And now, last but not least, please join me in welcoming Senator David Marsden. First, I'd like to commend the League of Women Voters for giving the Senate the opportunity to, to uh, go last and, uh, and set the record straight on everything. <laughs> now, it, it's, it's good to be here, and thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, we are... Uh, uh, in a situation where we have a constitutional amendment coming up. It is, I agree with my colleagues, it is less than, uh, less than perfect. I agree with uh, Delegate Levine. Be careful what you ask for, you might get it. There was a lot of pressure put on the legislature this year by the League, by Virginia uh, 1 2021, by a lot of folks. We had to get something done. It was obviously not going to get done in the House of Delegates given the political configuration. So it fell to the Senate to come up with the compromise, uh, is in, in my belief. Uh, it got there for a reason, is that the Senate is a more bipartisan group, and that's why it got out of the Senate 40 to nothing, because both sides were of the aisle were, were, uh, were, were contacted, were part of the process uh, that uh, Senator Barker and Senator Saslaw put together. Uh, part about the Supreme Court is, is uh, certainly a potential outcome of what we have here. Although I, got, I told uh, Delegate Levine, I had to straighten him out on one thing, is that we have two, two uh, members of the Virginia Supreme Court from Northern Virginia. Senator Bill Mims represented Loudoun County. And uh, the Chief Justice, Don Lemons, is a Madison Warhawk. Uh, grew up here, he and I were probation officers together in 1972 to 1974 in the North County office in McLean. So we're not totally shut out in, in terms of that, but it, but it is a danger. There's no question. When you talk about these criteria, how many of y'all think that, that communities of interest is a legitimate thing to look at? Okay, how about political jurisdictions? Is that a legitimate thing to look at? How about some kind of reasonable approach to balancing it based on political uh, affiliations? You know, Democrats, Republicans, something like that. Okay. Well, the interesting thing is uh, uh, my district is the poster child for redistricting uh, because it is long and skinny and way, weaves its way across Fairfax County. And, uh, uh, you know, clearly uh, it was done that way to make it a more competitive district for the party in political power at the time in the Senate, the Democratic Party. However, guess how many Senate districts in Virginia have only one political jurisdiction? Two. Senator Bill DeStef in Virginia Beach and me. I'm all Fairfax County. 
So I'm all one political jurisdiction. And you could make the argument that that's, well, that's really one county, one, you know, one uh, community of interest, sort of. And uh, it was the third least, when it was created, the third most competitive Senate district. And yet, and I agree, it's a funny looking district. <laughs> You know, on the, on, on the uh, you know, as you look at this thing, you know, clearly, who would, who would draw that? But when you look at all the criteria, it looks pretty good. And so that's the issue here. That's how monstrously difficult it is to do redistricting. This is not easy stuff. And the politics in the Senate at this point in time, we were behind at 40 to nothing, and I... Uh, there would have to be a broad consensus across Virginia that uh, somebody has introduced a bill that supersedes that constitutional amendment that, that pleases more people, is more fair, is, 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 is better at doing this. I don't know that that is certainly going to take place. So, although I have misgivings, like Delegate Levine has, and I think like a number of our members have, the die is cast, I think, as far as the Senate is concerned. I think it would be monstrously cynical uh, to now, at this point in time, for somebody like myself to say, well, now that, we're in, now that we're in charge, let's do something different. We sort of made a pledge by passing it the first time. Uh, but remember, remember, be careful what you ask for. You may get it. And what we may get is a Supreme Court uh, who gets to make this decision. And this is a Supreme Court, I do juvenile justice reform work, and this is a Supreme Court that when, this, when the United States Supreme Court said children sentenced to life without parole need a meaningful and real, realistic opportunity at release when they're sentenced to life without parole at the age of 15. And this is a group of people who ruled that geriatric parole and at, at the age of 62 uh, constitutes a meaningful and realistic opportunity at release. So, do I have confidence in them? No. I don't. But I have confidence in the system that we have. And the system is, it, we have is that the only way we could meet the needs of the people of Virginia and the League of Women Voters and Virginia 121 is for the Senate to come up with a compromise, and we did. And we got it out of there. And it has its merits, it has its faults, and I would hope, I would hope that the Supreme Court of Virginia will look at this thing seriously if that's what it gets to. I hope that two members of the same political party in the House of Delegates or in the, in the State Senate don't try to crash the whole thing hoping to get a better deal from the, uh, uh, from the Supreme Court. I'm hoping that if they do vote against it, it's for legitimate reasons of, uh, of the things that you know, all of you care about. But this is going to be a very, very difficult political process. Uh, but I think as far as the Senate is concerned, and that was the question I was asked to, to address today, is uh, what are the politics in the Senate? As far as I'm concerned, I have faith that people will try to do the right thing here, both the, the citizens, the, the delegates, the senators who are on the commission, and ultimately if it goes to the Supreme Court, uh, I like to be optimistic and think that they will all do the right thing. But remember, folks, we're not all the way home yet, and this is very, very difficult stuff. And uh, the one thing that Delegate uh, uh, Samira said, which is also true, our bigger problem is when we have our elections. Remember, we get 70% turnout in a presidential year, 50 in a governor's year, and up until this year, traditionally 30% in this off-off year. You know who did that? That was Harry Byrd to make sure that no federal election was going to ever mess with his ability to control the Virginia State Senate and, generally speaking, the legislature. And uh, that's a problem, you know, that we have to address. Because we wouldn't have the gerrymandering problems we have today if we had a system that allowed for people to get out and vote uh, when, they, uh, uh, when the President of the United States uh, is up for election. So, lots of issues, lots of problems. I'll take any questions that you have. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Mia Marin, and one question about the voting that you just mentioned uh, with all of our off-year elections. 
can Virginia just make uh, the fact that we vote every single year the f a reason to like get rid of Columbus Day and make voting a day a holiday in Virginia, a state holiday? Well, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in, in terms of what needs to be done via constitutional amendment and what needs can be done through a bill, but there are certain things that are set in the Constitution that we, you know, we would need to you know, to change, and as you've seen, that is a long and somewhat cumbersome process. Well, so I'm saying don't process. bother to change it, but just get the public to accept that Virginia will vote every year. What? And that, that we need to be aware as citizens that we need to go to the polls. Uh, yeah, I, I, and, and if anybody can tell me uh, how to get more people out to the polls, I, I raised $230,000 this year that I gave to other people so they could get people out to the polls. We did a little, a little better this year than we've done in the past, but Mark, did we hit 40% statewide? Right at 40, which is still, that's right. Some places where the, the, the this, this was a big improvement uh, over previous years, but remember, we were still 10 points under how many people voted statewide for Governor Northam, and we're 30 points below uh, the presidential uh, election. <coughs> I'm sorry. Okay, last, last question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I have a suggestion for all of those who are in the, it, here as our elected officials. Let's work on changing the rules in Virginia that allow for full absentee voting, early voting. Let's, <laughs> let's move towards making that turnout be a, a really robust number. And that is a, a great question and a, and a great way to close this out is that I think the decisions uh, electorally that the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia made during this election cycle, that that is first and foremost on our minds is anything we can do to make it easier for people to vote. I think you will find the Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate anxious to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let's give it up for our legislators. The legislators, thank you so very much, all of you. We really appreciate it. And trust me, you are going to want to come back after the break because not only are we going to hear from a commissioner from California, but we are also going to hear from one Virginia 2021's Brian Cannon, who is going to respond to Delegate Levine's. <laughs> Um, talk. So trust me, you're going to want to hang in there. So we're going to only take a quick 10 minute break. All right. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you very quickly our executive director of the League of Fairfax, Beth Tudon. Uh, thank you, Wendy. So you may have been to one of our 13 candidate forums this fall. Um, we do a lot of different things um, for educating voters, but something else we do, um, Ms. Fox Grage, is um, we run a high school voter registration program. And the last, we started a couple of years ago and we've registered thousands of students. You may know that student, that anyone, you have to be a US citizen, Virginia resident and such, but if you are, then you will be able to register to vote. So someone has to be, they have to turn 18 by the November election of, so, right, so right now, it, the vast majority of the high school seniors can register to vote because they will be 18 by November 3rd, 2020. And what's really exciting is not only can they register to vote, they can actually vote in the presidential primary, the Super Tuesday primary on March 3rd. So we're trying to reach all the seniors, as many as we can. So we would like you to be part of that. We've got some cards with a QR code. Um, also, if you can just type in the um, email, the website, there's a unique QR code for every high school in FCPS. But here's a short two minute video that explains the program um, that was filmed at Mount Vernon. We've had our second annual voter registration drive uh, with the League of Women Voters of Fairfax County. We bring students into the classrooms and they get to interact directly with representatives from the League of Women Voters to register to vote and to get a little bit a better understanding of what's going on in the political process. I mean, I never realized how important voting was until today. I never realized each and every vote really does count. We want to make sure it's across the board, equal across the board. So that her vote counts, my vote counts, your teacher's vote counts, your vote counts.
So that way you need to make sure that, like, you come to school to get educated, you need to be educated on who's running for different offices, the candidates are, because they're going to be making decisions for you. We try to get them to think about what their opinions are and what issues might matter. So we sent a survey in advance, and it had one question, and it was just about 15 issues or so, and said, please rank these. I was taking control, like doing something for the community, giving everyone my voice. When we have discussions with the students, for them to bring out their opinions, and they don't have to agree with ours or with each other, but to realize that their vote is what matters. That's really what counts. We kind of take them through the process of those struggles to vote, to trace a particular suffrage movement, either women's suffrage, African American, Native American groups, immigrants, so they can kind of see those struggles and you know what really is behind the reason that it's so important to vote. I thought it was a harder process. I thought it was a much longer process. It really took me three minutes. And I thought it was like so much longer. <laughs> so much longer. My students that will come back to visit me, they'll come in and they get so excited and they say, Mrs. Stewart, I voted. And, you know, it, it felt really cool. And I, I didn't realize, you know, all this stuff was going on. And so that's where you can see it. Sometimes it may not be immediately inside the classroom. But when you follow that progression over the years, the kids will come back and they thank you and they, they really get um, amped about it. Vote! You need to vote. Everyone has a voice. They need to vote. It's very important. Thank you. The Virginia League also is doing the same thing. It's the, they're running the Governor's Challenge, and so you're getting a business card passed around. So anytime you meet a student, just ask them if they're registered, talk to them about it, you'll have that. And there's also the League of Virginia website on the back where you can get their information for their Governor's High School Challenge as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. You probably saw a lot of familiar looking faces in the video. Uh, many of our volunteers are in the audience and we thank them. That is what makes it possible to be registering thousands of high school seniors to vote and to educate them about elections. With that, we now get to, and we want to give a very, very warm round of applause. We are so lucky. All, he flew here from California to talk to us about his independent commissioner on the California Redistricting Commission. We want to welcome Commissioner Andre Parvu, and we also want to welcome to the stage here uh, Brian Cannon from One, Virginia 1 2021. Come, come on up, Andre. Thank you so much, y'all. Um, it's nice to be among nerds. Uh, let me, let me, right? We, uh, so, and, and like, these are in the nerd community. Uh, commissioners from California are rock stars, uh, and I think that uh, that's true. I've met a lot of them. I'm so ha exact, uh, excited for Andre to be here, and we're going to talk about some important things. But I do want to take a moment to address uh, what I thought were some really powerful arguments from Delegate Levine. Come on down, have a seat. Uh, <laughs> that, that I think it's I think it's really important, and I want to use this as a teaser for everybody to come out. On, uh, on December 11th and hear us have a debate. And, and I need to listen to your radio show, man. You fired me up. So l let me suggest that I think there's something uh, that, that, that both uh, Delegate Levine and Delegate uh, Sickles mentioned the Iowa model, right, as kind of the gold standard of redistricting. I disagree with that slightly, but it's certainly better than what we have as the status quo in Virginia. Um, but if the commission in Iowa or the, the group basically deadlocks in Iowa, it goes to the state Supreme Court. <laughs> And for what it's worth, in, in California, if you guys hadn't done your work and come up with, with fair maps, it goes to the state Supreme Court, right? So that's a pretty common feature. In our original bill, we didn't have that uh, because it's just a default, because it's state law. Um, but let me add another layer of hopeful on here, is that if you believe that the state Supreme Court is a bunch of partisan Republican hacks, and that's fine, um, then I would suggest to you um, that let me see. The McAuliffe decision was four to three, the voter restoration of rights. So you had three people willing to kind of cross party lines there. And um, one, of those, uh, one of those justices is actually up for uh, election in January of this year. So there's a chance to change that. So the court's going to change and slightly change. Um, but further, you can't remove the, what's called the federal question inherent in redistricting. 
Um, every time Virginia redistricts, we have to redistrict for two reasons federally. Forget what the state law says. Federally, we have to redistrict because we have to ensure voting rights are protected for uh, racial, ethnic, and language minority communities. And second, we have to redistrict because a lot of people moved around. You guys keep getting more and more people up here, as you know. And in Southwest Virginia, they get fewer and fewer. So the districts have to change to respect one person, one vote. And so there's always a federal question. So you can get it. So anytime there's a state court case, you can, if it's involving those things, you can remove it to federal court. And I think that's what makes the state Supreme Court thing helpful. When I talked to Senator Barker about it, one of the things he said is writing it in there as a direct um, vehicle to get to the state Supreme Court will eliminate the trial court, which would slow us down in a time when we don't have a lot of time to redistrict because we have off-year elections, another conversation clearly, um, <laughs> that, to, to get us there. So I think there's some good answers for questions and I think there's some, some, some healthy debate here and we should all be aware of it, right? Like this is important and I don't want to amend our state constitution lightly. Um, but I would say that I think the things that keep me up at night about redistricting reform involve uh, involve two big elements. Now, there's a lot of things we need to do with enabling legislation. But one of those big elements is ensuring that our commission that we have, particularly on the citizen side, is as diverse as possible to actually reflect the diversity of Virginia, right? Both demographically, geographic, and elsewise. Uh, and that's really, really important. And then the other thing we need to do is make sure that criteria is good, that we're you know, using the, the recipe by which you bake the cake um, produces good results too. And I think California did an outstanding job of that. So I've got some questions for Andre to go through on their selection process, things we can learn, things I think we can incorporate. Um, and I also want to give you a chance, Andre, just to say a few words at the top and we'll go through some questions and give you all a chance to, to ask some questions of the commissioner as well. So thank you for being here, Andre. Sure, no, you're quite welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Wow, thanks to the League of Women Voters and all that you do. Thank you, Bryant, with uh, first, uh, uh, first Virginia 2021 and all the delegates that spoke before and senators. I am so impressed because I know Virginia's in good hands. You know. I am really <laughs> impressed. This is wonderful. It's wonderful uh, to come back home. And I say I come back home because Virginia actually is my home. I'm a native son of Virginia by way of California, yes. I know some of you, I was raised in places with names like Nottoway County, Meharan County, Lunenburg County, Prince Edwards. Uh, in fact, I was the first African American to integrate the public school system in Victoria, Virginia, of Lunenburg County. <laughs> so I've come home like a prodigal son or something like that. And I've also lived in the Tidewater area. I, uh, Lived in Norfolk, Newport News. No, I lived in Newport News, took classes at Hampton, went to work downtown on Front Street in Norfolk, and swam in the Atlantic Ocean in Virginia Beach <laughs> on a good summer day. <laughs> Not like our California beaches, but I still love it. And Buck Row Beach and so on. Um, and I also, uh, I'm a property owner. I own land in Virginia. I'm a taxpayer here. And I also yeah, <laughs> have been so for years and years and years. In fact, they're due in December. I have to think about that. But anyway, uh, um, I also worked as a, uh, as a what, what do you call them, a house, the person, a doorman in Roslyn, Virginia at the London House on Wilson Avenue when I was going to school at Howard University. So I uh, worked in Virginia, went to school in Washington and lived in Maryland because I was born in Baltimore. So I'm reasonable. <laughs> I know how to get around. Anyway, now getting back to enough about myself. You may wonder uh, what got me into this. I'm actually a child of the civil rights movement. Um, I'm a product of the 60s. Um, in fact, I learned some of my civic engagement right here in Virginia doing marches and rallies in central Virginia for the Voting Rights Act when I was very, very young. Uh, you see, I was a baby at the time, <laughs> only five years old in 1965, but I remember the marches. So, so this is not something, this isn't history that's far removed from me. My mother and my grandparents were, a part, uh, were victims of voter suppression. And for me, gerrymandering, along with the poll tax and moving ballots and intimidating people at the polls and destroying ballots and all the rest that goes with, Voter suppression, gerrymandering is right up there with me, uh, up there for me, with me. 
So uh, I'm vehemently opposed, and I see that I'm in a light crowd here. So I'm very comfortable <laughs> being able to share my common interest in doing something about it. Um, I also uh, feel that um, civic engagement is the price, the cost and the price we pay for freedom. So it's important to get involved. It's not a spectator. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I'm a child of that era. Uh, the League of Women's Voters, of course, is a, a prime example with continuing the efforts of the women's suffrage movement and getting the right to vote out. We have a very strong league in California. I was just in New Jersey. There's a strong league there. Just spoke in Harrisburg, strong league there. Everywhere I go, there's a strong league. And that gives me great gratitude and strength to know that we're strong in Virginia and everywhere I go and land my feet. I'm a recipient of the uh, Ash Grant from Harvard Kennedy uh, School of Government, so I want to give them acknowledgement too, because without them I would not be here as well. Uh, we, after our redistricting, uh, won a prestigious award. It's very competitive for $100,000. We could have done anything that we wanted to do with it. Probably gone to Napa Valley, drank wine, or maybe <laughs> to Catalina. But we decided that we were going to take that money, divvy, divvy it up among the 14 of us, and go on the road and do what we're doing here to get the word out and to promote and advocate uh, dem democratic reform in terms of redistricting. So that's another reason we're here, and Brian was kind enough to be a part of our road show and to actually implement uh, our, our visits here in Virginia. So I do thank you for, for that. Um, I have to acknowledge them as well. Um, now I think what's stated here is that um, on the agenda, I want to give you everyone enough time to ask questions. I want to be brief, and I know, Brian, you want to ask me yeah. some questions, and I don't know where it falls in, but I, one of these here that I'm looking at is that uh, you'd like to know more about the application process? Or? Yeah, so Please go right ahead. Let, me, let me frame it in a Virginia sure. lens and so what we could learn. Sure. So sure. Um, I would really like to see Virginia have an open application process for anybody who wants to apply to be able to apply and join the commission. California did that, I think, pretty darn well. How did you hear about it? How did you apply? How was that process for you as somebody who went, went through it, Andre? Yeah, well, I'm a... Uh, Again, I'm, I'm very steeped in civic engagement because of my Virginia roots, so I'm involved in everything in Los Angeles, California. Just, we have a referendum system there where we collect names and put them on signatures for the ballot. So they stand outside of supermarkets and stores. and So, so I'm always curious, and I read every line because there's always a lot of trick language in there. <laughs> you know, they often say the opposite of what they really intend. But this one caught my attention because it dealt with redistricting and maps. And I'm a geographer by training. Um, my training is in urban planning. I'm an urban planner in, in my other job for the city of Los Angeles. I'm also a community activist. And, uh, and when maps and districts uh, just caught my eye. But uh, I found out that um, they were looking for uh, 14 qualified people to take on the enormous responsibility of of drawing maps for the state of California. And what that means is that, uh, just to give you a little perspective, California has about 40 million people and uh, scattered over 58 states. We have 80 assembly districts, which is the lower house, and we have 40 senatorial districts, um, and we have 53 congressional districts. So that's 177 maps that were that are required to be drawn, and we call it the People's First Act. And I like that title, the People First Act. Um, I always believe in putting people first. So um, it just naturally caught my attention. And in terms of our process, what occurs, uh, what occurs is that we um, initially received 36,000 applicants throughout the state of California. And that number was whittled down to about 5,000 after you got rid of all the, you know, the, you know. Who does this work? We have a Bureau of State Audits, which is an impartial, nonpartisan uh, bureau or branch of government within our state government structure. Um, 
So they had the massive responsibility of reducing that number to 5,000 initially. And then we had to reduce, they had to reduce that number even further down to ultimately the golden number of 120. So they looked at background checks, conflicts of interest. They looked at, uh, um, they looked at essay questions. We had several essay questions like, um, show how you've demonstrated that you have been impartial or, or show your appreciation for the geographic and ethnic uh, diversity of the state or show that you have, demonstrate how you've exercised your analytical skills and so on and so on and so on. So there were a team of staff people that worked for the Bureau that sorted those numbers out ultimately and also there were legislative strikes too. No one could have worked for elected, uh, an elected official in uh, five years or so. And uh, so that, and plus the elected officials, if someone worked for their opponent's campaign 10 years prior and they just didn't like them or whatever, <laughs> the legislators had the option of striking that person, him or her, for whatever reason. You know, they had some leeway there. I think there were about 24 strikes that we experienced but ultimately, that number went down to 120 and then to 60. And then from 60, we actually had a system where we used, I know the Virginia State Lottery used the same little bingo balls and the <laughs> thing there. Well, out of the 36, they had the bingo balls where eight names just popped up. And there were, uh, what was there, let's see, no, nine. Yeah, nine names. Uh, three. Democrats, three Republicans, and three decline the state or no party preference or independence on one of those. So there were nine. Those nine then had to select six. My math is kind of wrong here. They I think it was I think it was eight. Eight. Eight, because it was only two decline to states. Two decline to states, yeah. that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. You've studied us very well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so they in turn had to select the other six, the remaining six. So we call them the lucky eight and uh, the chosen six, the chosen ones. That was one of the chosen ones. <laughs> but anyway, to get to the point. They, they, they chose us based on not just our background skills, but our ethnic diversity was a part of it. Uh, if the bingo balls came up with all whatever, Asian or white or Latino or whatever, there had to be some diversity geographically as well. I'm in Los Angeles, Southern California. So we have a unique balance, north, south, east, and west. It just, it's just fortunate that it turned out that way. And, um, Basically, that was the selection process. We decided to go on a road collectively as a team, all 14 of us. We could have done any arranged to do this. In, it, it had never been done before. So we could have chosen to outreach to the public any way we wanted. We chose to go as a team. We, we, we actually opt, opted to go uh, as a a full team, a full body, because we wanted the people in the state of California to see this is what you got for your vote. I mean, this is, uh, this has never been done before anywhere. You know, you took this initiative on, and uh, we don't want to have electronic uh, faces and talking heads on some screen somewhere. We want to come to your community. So as a result of that, we traveled to uh, 34, we had 34 public hearings. We, uh, in various parts of the state, north, south, east, and west, we didn't go extreme north. Perhaps this new commission will do that. We simply did not have time to do it. We didn't go extreme south because the population is mostly desert down south in Imperial County and so on. But um, we, give, we gave ample uh, time for individuals to, to travel to where we were. We had 2,700 speakers giving testimony. We also, um, had 70 deliberation meetings, in Sacramento and other places. We also had 22,000 written comments. And all of this was transparent. Uh, everything that was submitted to us was open to public scrutiny and review. I better hurry up. I think that's my cue to be quick here. Okay. <laughs> but the process was totally transparent. No decisions, no dis even when we had our meetings to discuss 
what was going on uh, and the data and all the rest. Um, it was open to the public. All of this on top of the fact that we were seated on December the 1st and we had to have these maps in in nine months, a period of nine months. We had to find a, we had to get an executive direct, we had to hire staff, we had to have civil rights attorneys, we needed an uh, executive director, we needed uh, administrative people, we needed, and we had to let RFP, uh, RFPs to review applicants, to create them first and then review them and select staff all within a very short window of time. And uh, keep in mind, we were 14 com complete strangers. 14 people, never seen each other, never knew how to work with one another before, but we knew that we had one goal in common, and that was to complete 177 maps. Lay down whatever differences we had, roll up our sleeves and get busy, because the clock was ticking. And this was a project, a, a, a process, an experiment in democracy that could not fail. We could not allow it to fail. So the 14 of us, whatever partisan, well, we didn't express any. I don't recall any partisan comments or arguments or debates coming along the way, honestly. We all knew how important this was, so we put our personal politics behind us and did what we thought was right for the people in the state of California. Andre, that's awesome. Uh, can we give a big hand? They worked so hard uh, to do what's right. Wendy, do we have time for some questions? Diane Shea from Fredericksburg. What was your budget? Oh my goodness, <laughs> very little. We had about $10 million to do this. That includes our per diem, that included salaries, that included travel arrangement where we, we tried to get volunteer venues that we, we were like really high profile, so we tried to go to places, be a San Jose, San Diego, that were free. Uh, <laughs> We carpooled together. We, uh, we roommated at hotels. We were just swashbuckling around and just, you know, hoboing around. <laughs> we didn't even have an office because nothing like this had been done. So we didn't have desks or tables or pencils or pens or computers <laughs> because the state process for procurement is a very long, drawn out process. It usually takes nine months just to get something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a ream of paper, let alone uh, a chair or something like that. So we had to scrape and get leftover stuff from, from different offices. So we had a hodgepodge of stuff. So we had a very limited budget. However, I'll, I'll be more brief with my answer and succinct. We had a limited budget, but they took care of knowing that the state, that is, Secretary of State's office, knew that we were going to have litigation, so that was built in. That's, that didn't come out of pocket. But uh, all the expenses involved with hiring the line drawers, our technical people, everything else a part of that project came out of our, our budget. Legal counsel really ate, a, ate a, into that budget big time. But uh, we, on August the 15th, 2011, the 14 of us submitted our maps to the Secretary of State's office on time and under budget and with a lot of sweat <laughs> and pressure along the way. Sherry Zachary again. Are there uh, elected officials on the commission? And then what is the process once the commission has drawn the lines? Does it go to the legislature for an up and down vote? Uh, no, it would, that, no, it does not. No, first, first question first. There were no current elected officials. We had one commissioner, uh, Commissioner Peter Yao, who was a former mayor for the city of Claremont. But that was like 10 years prior or something. It was many years, decades before. But he had um, since become an engineer and was retired. So no, no standing elected officials, no lobbyists, nobody who's worked on it, that campaigns, for example. Um, it's amazing. I, I hadn't done any of that myself as involved as I've been. But no, no elected officials. And secondly, once we turned over our maps, the legislators had nothing to, they had nothing to do with the process from start to finish. In fact, they kept away from us. They couldn't talk with us. They weren't our friends. We couldn't go back and ask for money. They were like, no, you guys are on your own. They had no idea what we were going to come up with. Uh-huh, pardon me? Ultimate authority. Ultimate authority? Yes, the commission. 
Okay, we another collectively had to have a supermajority of nine commissioners had to vote for the final maps. The senator, the assembly, and the congressional maps. Nine votes out of, out of uh, 14. And we turned those over and that was stamped and it was upheld. We had six Supreme Court challenges. We upheld six out of six. In fact, the judges on our Supreme Court, we have like nine, I think eight are Republicans and one is a Democrat. They said these maps are, you know, Irrefutable. I mean, these are excellent maps you came up with. So, yeah. One question over here? Yes, sir. It sounds like you set up a totally new organization to do your map drawing. Uh, is there you know, a particular reason that you didn't use state resources, uh, some state uh, division who might have had some of those uh, talents already? Good question. And no, we didn't set up a whole new map drawing division or unit or entity. We uh, went out to bid for our line drawers and map drawers. We happened to select out of many, uh, and they had to go through the same criteria we went through in terms of uh, the scrutiny of being impartial and not having worked. There was some concern they'd be swayed towards the Democratic side, the map drawers, or towards the Republican side or whatever. They took directions from us, and we chose the uh, um, this, we used the state database, which was housed at Berkeley, California, and we used line drawers that were familiar with the state ba database. So no, we, we drew heavily upon these individuals uh, with, uh, um, I forgot their name right now, but uh, no, we didn't do it internally. We went out to bid, and that was a selection process. Great, thank you so very, very much. We do really appreciate that. And now, if you want to, you can go ahead and stay up here too. Brian, come on up. And then let's also bring up Deb Wake. She is the president of the League of Women Voters of Virginia. So let's give it up for Brian, Andre, and Deb. I think I'm supposed to go ahead and talk about people-powered fair maps. Okay. So at the end of June, when the Supreme Court ruled that it's okay for political gerrymandering, that that's a tool of the political parties, National League got involved and said, okay, so to, that, to us that means that we can no longer look to the Supreme Court for um, a solution. And they developed the people-powered fair maps. And what that is, it's a four-tiered attack that we're going to take on gerrymandering. That is a 50 state campaign, and a lot of it you've already heard about. There's the constitutional amendment is one attack. And the thing I would point out is that Virginia, uh, we're fortunate in that we get to utilize all of these uh, tools in order to tackle gerrymandering. So we have the constitutional amendment, we have the criteria bill, we have the ballot initiative once um, it goes through the process and gets passed by the legislature. And then we have the VRA, which you've heard a lot about today, and that's the Voting Rights Act. So what happened in 2013 is the Supreme Court said that, um, that discrimination no longer exists at the same level that it did in 1965, and that the formulas that determined whether a law met the, cre the pre clearance um, bar set. That so, what pre clearance means is that any time a state passed a state that is under pre clearance, a state that has a history of discrimination, that those states need to have the Department of Justice look at the laws that they're passing and are they suppressing or discriminating against voters. And what happened in the Shelby versus Holder decision in 2013, it took the teeth out of that. And so what you saw then in response to that, within 24 hours of the gutting of the Voting Rights Act was suppressive ID laws in Texas. Um, things happening in North Carolina, but you also saw Ohio and Wisconsin, states that were not under preclearance previously, we're now 
jumping in to discriminate and suppress votes. And this will be the first redistricting to take place since 1965 that does not have the Voting Rights Act in place to protect against gerrymandering. And that is a concern for us. Uh, we've, with, I'm also a Lobby Corps volunteer for National. We have been working on passage of the VRA um, for almost a year now, trying to get support. It's always had bipartisan support in the Congress. The last time that it passed in, 20, in 2006, it passed unanimously in both chambers. And now we're having problems getting people, legislators, to sign on and support it. And that's, that's very frustrating because the right to vote should not be a partisan issue. So I hope you all will, will take some time after this, and I know Andre's gonna stick around, and talk to him a little bit more about the citizen application process, because I think that's one of the ways we can take this amendment, which we had to make some compromises to get it through the legislature. One of the ways we can take it from where it is now and really, really plus it up to ensure that we get good people who are willing to serve, and they're out there, right, who are willing to serve, and we bring them in in a transparent process that's open and it has checks and balances, and we get it done. Um, I would also suggest that when you're thinking about redistricting reform in Virginia and you're trying to evaluate all the different opinions in this, there are legislators that have their opinions. Uh, there's an advocate who's been working for five years on this as his full-time job who has an opinion about it, right? Um, and uh, let me also, as, a, as an asterisk, the league I'm eternally grateful for because you all helped sponsor the, and, and make possible that competition in 2011. When you guys were doing your work as the commission, um, I was in law school and got to draw maps. Um, in that competition, and that showed me that it's not as hard as you think to actually draw fair maps. As long as you're not trying to re-elect somebody, you're just trying to keep a community together, it's actually fairly reasonable. I did it in a week um, of spring break in my last year of law school. Um, so the Lee, I'm super grateful for the League for empowering me like that and a bunch of other people to know how to do this better. Um, but let me suggest that if you're looking to evaluate what we've got on the table in Virginia, that you don't have to take my word for it, and you don't have to take any legislator's word for it, Look at groups that have been fighting for this for a very long time. The League of Women Voters, the Brennan Center for Justice, Common Cause, who got the work done in California with a lot of other folks, uh, the Campaign Legal Center that's been filing a lot. All those groups have uh, Dave Daly, who wrote the seminal book, which I can't say aloud, um, on gerrymandering. Uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> just a uh, rat. <laughs> uh, but you know, look at those folks, and they've all endorsed this plan and have said that here are ways to plus it up in ways that we've talked about there. So uh, I'm super grateful for you all being here and, and thinking about this so deeply with us because we need to. And, and Andre, there, do you have words of wisdom for us? I don't want to tell you what to do, but, but we could use a little wisdom here about how we're selecting good people and such. Uh, I'll just say uh, people that realize that our democracy is a gift. I mean, this isn't something that just started. Democracy is something that just started stopped and started at the walls of Athens and, and, uh, and, 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 and the Agora in Greece. I mean, it didn't stop, start and stop with the signing of the Constitution or the um, Declaration of Independence. It's a commodity. It's, 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 it's something, it's an entity, it's a precious gift that we have. And it's constant, we're committed to upholding it, to unfolding it, to, to expanding it and make it applicable to every Every citizen in this nation, man, woman, and voting teenager, if not child, whoever can vote, and to to realize that uh, that one man, one vote, and one fair representation of that is doable. Transparency is doable. We shown that transparency. You can have government that's transparent. You can have a body of people a body of people who can put their partisanship aside. I know that sounds odd in this day and time, but for a common cause, you can, we can come together, if, even temporarily, and do something that's good for the, for the people. So that's what I'd like us to think of. And I saw a license plate that said outside in DC, it says, in taxation without representation. When I saw it on the train looking, I say, in, 
vote casting without representation. <laughs> there we go. So let's move this movement forward, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, League of Women Voters, and thank you, Brian, oh, for your thank invitation. You. Right. Thank you, guys. Deb, would you like the last word? Wendy, do you get the last word? Let me, let me put this quick little bow on this. I'm happy to take questions if we can, but I also want to be respectful of folks' time. But Delegate Samira said something I thought was very, very wise. He said, even if you get this amendment through and you get all the enabling legislation, our work isn't done, right? We've got to be good watchdogs. Now, hopefully what we do is create a process by which people can see in, right? And we can participate, but we've got to be good watchdogs. And I'm so grateful for the League and all of your leadership, Deb, and everybody who's come before you and who will come after you uh, for helping do that. I'm so grateful for all the One Virginia volunteers, a lot of whom are also League members, um, uh, coming here and, and helping out. This is really awesome, so thank you.